one question obsesses me as the year 2019 begins in India, and that is Is the 21st century going to belong to India? Will this be the century of Asia? And will India fulfill all its aspirations as a country that we have seen, that it has had in the last seven, eight decades? And what are the few things on which we as a country need to create a consensus and pressurize our country to be directed towards. I was born in the early 70s. India was what its preamble amended says, a socialist country. I am not just shocked, it makes me furious but even today, on Indian college and university campuses, there is a debate. And that people think it's debate worthy whether India should be a socialist country or if we should adopt free market. It's, it's infuriating. And I'll tell you uh, some very, very broad sense of life parameters and measures and numbers. How many of you think you know anybody in India today who doesn't have a phone? Seriously, ask yourself this. How many of you, I'm not talking about children, obviously. How many of you know any Indian who does not have a phone? How many of you think you know an Indian who really really cannot afford to wear some kind of a footwear. How many of you have been to an Indian home in the last 10 years which does not have electricity? Think about it. Now I'll take you to socialist India, the country I was born in. We would apply for a telephone. Very few people would actually uh, dare to do that. But just guess, how many years do you think it took to get a landline in your house after you applied with the recommendation of a member of parliament. Just think about it. Any guesses? 20 years and you still don't get the phone was a normal thing. I remember the day we got a gas connection. Gas connection? Not something you think about much. Gas connection. And my father said, we applied for this connection when Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister. And we got it when Rajiv Gandhi is the Prime Minister. <laughs> and we considered ourselves lucky. Just 14 years. In 14 years, in a small town in India, you get a gas connection. In 1991, when there was a cliché debate about what India should be in the 21st century, which was fast approaching, just a decade from now, with two weeks, two weeks of forex to pay for our oil reserves, we actually shipped our gold physically. Physically, gold was taken away from India to give us two additional weeks worth of foreign exchange. And we brought in liberalization. The Indian economy in 1991, the budget of India, the complete budget of India that Manmohan Singh presented in June 1991, the economy of India was smaller than the economy of Telangana today. Think about it. Obviously, a uh, cycle was a preferred means of transport because nobody could offer anything better. This is the India I'm talking about. There was no worthwhile middle class. And middle class in those days was defined as those households which are in between 2,000 rupees to about 5,000 rupees a month. Think about it. In 27 years, we have come to a point where everything is a mobile phone, telecom sector has done miracles. More Indians have passport today than Indians have not cycles in 20, uh, 1991. More Indians have passports today, which means they're planning to or have traveled outside the country. Yet, this 
magical transformation of India from a socialist India to not unfortunately a capitalist India, but a mixed economy with a flavor of private investment, de-licensing, has still not found unfortunately an ideological champion to advocate. It is considered bad politics, and time and again, the only thing worthwhile the politics and government of this country believes worth doing for this country is to go back to that socialist rhetoric which has put us at 1% growth rate with a 15% inflation for over two decades. Just think about it, 1% growth, 15% inflation. You can just think about it. What should we do? What can we as a country do so that we can bridge the gap with that neighbor that's zooming past economically called China? How can we create ourselves to that kind of a path from which our growth can no longer be stopped? How can we create jobs where our population whose growth is thankfully stabilized truly becomes the kind of demographic dividend we talk about? Not talking about super pardon for India in terms of military, in terms of dominating the world, but where most citizens have a good quality of life. Oh, the problems are disappearing fast. The next problem, which classically represents the Indian hypocrisy, is called caste. I heard when I was six years old that one of the principles of the Indian constitution. One of the principles on which every government must function is to strive to create a casteless society. Ask yourself, have you seen from the 1970s? And I asked myself, the answer is, it's a joke. Has any government done anything to make India casteless? Of course not. We've done everything to make it more and more caste-centric. So, uh, I, I thought, what can we do if this is really a dream worth achieving? And I must uh, confess here that I know the debate on caste and public discussions on caste is very uh, controversial. Uh, it also shows our personal hypocrisies in terms of our own positions. I can debate caste, what's my own caste, therefore, what's my view? Am I making a view that is very convenient for me, etc. Uh, but I believe time has come for India to define a citizen as a casteless citizen. As in, anybody born out of an intercaste marriage. Declare people, very simple process, you know, father, mother have different castes. Call them casteless individuals. We should be proud of these casteless Indians. We should promote them, we should give them special lines in airports. Should even give them a little reservation so that people do not marry outside the caste for them fear that they will lose reservation. And you have it until you reach a tipping point. No, nobody knows their cause because the parents come from different contexts. In two generations, they can achieve it. You have done nothing so far. When I spoke about the rationalization of government, one of the things that's uh, very hurtful to a capitalist ideologue, somebody who believes government must be small, governments should not do everything, and there is this huge left wing and the neo left backlash against the idea of saying capitalism doesn't work, it breeds inequality of such uh, magnitude that one person, people in the country can have 80% of the wealth, 50% of the wealth, and so on and so forth. And therefore, you cannot trust people. You have to trust the government. You cannot trust the uh, people once you leave them free. And it's a very strange debate on the, uh, across all countries in the world where the left and right fight in a very weird way. The left believes people should be left free from evening 6 o'clock when they go home till next morning 6 o'clock in terms of what they eat, what they drink, what they watch, who they marry, who they sleep with, etc. The moment they get up in the morning and come out of the house, go to office, oh, you can't trust them, in fact, making profits, oh my God. So even if you put a samosa or milchi bandi outside this auditorium, we have a food inspector to inspect whether the food is hygienic or not. Issue a certificate. You know where it leads to. Not one idli or samosa in the history of India has been made 
safer for consumption by people in this country because of the existence of a dinosaur called Food Inspector. Throw him. Read carefully tonight when you go home, what does a governor do in a state? We don't need governors. They can go. The oath to the chief minister can be issued by the chief justice of that state. That's it. And so on and so forth. So, one of the weirdest things you'll find is this. Whether you're left or right, and if you'll agree there will be so many taxes the government imposes, so many subsidies it gives, you will be amazed by this thought. Most of you will be taxed at about 250 points in a 24 hour cycle and be recipient of about 100 subsidies in a given day. Think about it. Mukesh Mbani's son, when he drives that Bentley, Bentiana, and fills diesel, gets subsidy on diesel. Mrs. Ambani's kitchen has a subsidized gas cylinder, six of them per year. They legally and morally deserve it. So what is the point of taxing someone, subsidizing them? Taxing someone, subsidizing them. Think about it. I am in agreement with the leftist view that there are some people who are rich, tax them. There are some people, subsidize them. But what is the point of taxing the person who receives a subsidy and subsidizing the taxpayer? Rationalize it. That is the level to which government has ensured its powers have grown into every segment. For example, anybody in India who earns, example, 75,000 rupees a month should not get a single subsidy. Can we agree on that? Abolish all the subsidies such people get. And then we have a problem with saying. This diesel which you are subsidizing is also going to somebody very poor. Well, there is a different way to subsidize the person. So start abolishing taxes, start abolishing those subsidies. You will find the government's one. The biggest challenge any country faces in the world today is its own government. Government has never, never been a great solution. It's always been a problem. It's becoming a bigger problem in our country than ever. So yes, rationalize this tax and subsidy to the point where you say, so many people, pure taxpayers, so many people, pure subsidy givers, and we'll see if over a period of time, if you really believe, more and more people should become wealthy enough to pay taxes, less and less people need subsidy, deserve subsidy, etc. The next aspect of is this spirit of liberalization, which has never become something Indians own up, which means no Indian politician believes privatization is good politics. There is a simple way to Tell me, Trump, I've always uh, been uh, uh, aghast that nobody has thought in Indian public context that if an Infosys or a TCS can make a driver a rich person by giving them shares, why can't Indian railways use giving ESOPs to all the railway employees the best step towards privatizing the Indian railways eventually? What we all have failed as a society, as a government, is this essentially. We don't trust people. We don't trust people. We don't trust each other. We don't believe India is safe in the hands of Indians. As businessmen, as students, the only select class of people who can be trusted are those who make it to parliament to form the government and those civil servants that clique is the worst thing to leave the destiny of your country. We have to take back the country from these people. The destiny of the country has to move away from the government. Today most Indian babies' rights are what a government gives you when very rudimentary reading of political science will tell you rights are not what governments give people. Rights are that which the government cannot take away. If government gives you something, it's a license. It can be withdrawn. Your right to life is not a license. Unfortunately, we accept that it is. Which is why, ask any Indian in any context, read the letters to the editor, any problem, they'll say, the government is not doing it. First thing you should, let the government go away from here. Unfortunately, that's not happening. So, as somebody 
whole myth of Paul brought up in a socialist India. An India without television, India without telephone, India without too much electricity. Uh, they wrote letters to each other, sometimes these letters from Hyderabad to Bombay would take three months to come, so in six months you could exchange 500 words each. A uh, country in which uh, obviously nobody had a motorcycle, most of them were on our cycles. A country where nobody had money, so poverty was common, we were very equal, we did not see the inequality of that day. To the country that has come here, we have seen the power of capitalism, my generation has. It requires you to understand what power free markets does. What free market does, what it's based on is this. How should two people deal with each other? Like I said, the leftist is very happy to give you the liberty in your personal life, takes it away in the economic life, the other side of it, the religious right thing, they seem to be favoring giving you economic freedom. Which means the moment you go to the office, the right winger is very happy to let you free. Who will reduce the taxes? Oh, we make the labor laws more liberal. Fire people. The moment you finish office and go back at six o'clock home, they say, you can't eat this, you can't drink this, you can't buy this. So one part of you is chained by either group. What free market liberal democracy demands is that I be left free from morning to evening and evening to morning. That I be left free as an economic productive entity as well as a human being. My mind, my wallet, my soul have to be aligned. That is the India that can really capture the spirit of this 25th century. It's the kind of country you people deserve. Young people who, four or five of them, can come together today, work from different places, and create a billion dollar enterprise. A billion dollars, let me tell you. Nine people made it. Instagram acquisition was a little more money than what India had as its total asset in 1991, pre-liberalization socialist India. Five of you can get together and make it. So grab this country from the government by understanding that the greatest things will happen to people if you let them free. It is about freedom that this battle is all about. I would like to believe, having lived in India of emergency, of the Indira Gandhi assassination, Sikh rights, of Putra, of uh, wars of your fought in Pakistan with China. The Indian that I really would love and hope to see in the next 30, 40, 50 years is the India in which every person is free, free of who they were at birth. Nothing that they acquired by birth is a hindrance in the path of what they would like to take away. That country where every Indian is free, that country where India trusts Indians, does not need government to regulate you in most areas. Just think about this. 300 years before Socrates, or centuries before Jesus Christ, there was an equation ancient India had. E to the power I pi. Minus one equals zero. Some of you must have heard it. Engineers, students of science, maths. E to the power I pi minus one equals zero. One of the most amazing numerical concepts under root of the negative number. The uh, ratio of the circumference and the uh, uh, dam uh, peri uh, diameter of the cycle. These are the concepts not to Indians. If you can become, if I and you can try for that kind of excellence again, each one of us, through one act this year, I think we claim the year, we claim the century. This can truly be the Indian 21st century. Thank you.